Hello, my name is Mark Whitfield. I play guitar. What's up, Jazz R and Jazz Lovers? <laughs> we are in around Switzerland for the Jazz R Festival. I'm here to play some guitar with some great friends of mine. Uh, I invited Raymond Angry to play keys, James Genus to play bass, and Gene Lake to play drums. And uh, at the invitation of my old friend Fritz Reynolds, we sent some tunes, and we are excited to be working with the students and putting together a nice program of music for this weekend's concerts. The idea of learning new music, right? How, how would I learn a new song? Um, for me, you know, music is like language. It's about communication, but it's also, um, uh, 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 you know, the actual process of learning a language. Um, so you have building blocks, you have phrases, and then you have things that you recognize. So if I were memorizing a speech or a monologue, I would be looking for... Uh, um, looking for, for uh, recognizable phrases, things that I could break down into, in, into building blocks that, that help me tell a story. And then the story is easy to, to, easier, easy to remember and easier to recount. So learning new music is like that for me. Um, I've been playing long enough now where if, the, if, the, if something is so difficult that I can't actually play it relatively quickly it's probably something that's just outside of my you know outside of my of my capabilities so um it's not so much my ability to you know to to assimilate the music as much as it is to put it together in in sort of recognizable phrases for myself so that it's part becomes a story that i'm telling and so uh i try to hear um hear a flow, uh, uh, and I, without sounding too ambiguous or abstract, you know, harmony and melody has a flow. And it's not, and you know, the thing about it is we often talk about music in terms of how uh, um, relatable it is to people, to everyday everyday people's ears, you know, not like musicians. And what, and what that really means is how familiar the sound is. And so I try to relate pieces, new things, new, new pieces of music to sounds that I can recognize, things that, that you know that are familiar to me, and put it together in that way, and then begin to see it as a story, uh, uh, and then I find and I find my voice in it. And once I do that, I'm there. Like what, once I find my own voice in whatever the music is, my way of telling the story, um, it's going to be hard for me to lose that. And so I recommend that you know for any, especially young musicians learning new music now, just take, don't rush through it. You know. Uh, um, Imagine, you know, if you were learning a speech that you had to give uh, uh, a monologue for, you know, in, in a high pressure situation, you'd want to take your time, you know, and, 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 and music is something. What, it, 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 an additional component to learning music is that once you learn a new piece of music and really internalize it, that story, those melodies, those harmonies, those phrases are now part of your working vocabulary. So the more time you spend assimilating it, inter internalizing it, and having it become your own, the more uh, you enrich your own musical vocabulary. So uh, um, it, the idea, uh, you know, you, if I'm asked to recount a, a memorable moment, that uh, uh, something that stands out uh, from my past, from my history of playing music, uh, I'll start by saying... Um, no profound effect, you know, has ever been had by something happy and positive, right? Like, it's like, who learns from, from, a, from a compliment? You learn very little. You learn how to smile and say thank you, right? But you, we really learn and grow from, uh, um, from constructive and, and, and uh, uh, sometimes often harsh criticism. You know, and I, I'm old enough to have, thank goodness, you know, you know, I caught the the end of the golden age of jazz. You know, when I when I got out of college at Berkeley and moved back to New York in 1987, I got to play with Roy Haynes and Art Blakey and and, and uh, Betty Carter and and Carmen McRae and Hank Jones and Tommy Flanagan. And, you know, and, and all all you know, uh, all of these wonderful musicians. Um, and, you know, and they were all, you know, they had all, at the, you know, Clark Terry, Dizzy Gillespie, you know, they, they were at the end of their lives, end of their careers. And they came from a time when the world was a much harsher place. Um, and, uh, and, you know, my parents were from that generation. My parents, my father was born in 1920 and my mother was in 1923. Beautiful, wonderful, articulate, intelligent people, but they were hard. <laughs> they had lived through 
uh, a much tougher world uh, um, and maintain their dignity and, and compassion, uh, uh, you know, through it. And what that and what I learned sort of intuitively, I didn't understand it uh, um, in, in a way that I could explain it until much later, is that uh, um, understanding what real compassion and you know for uh, you know and, and for other people uh, allows you to separate being nice f- from being kind. Right, being pleasant, you know, and things. And so I know it's kind of a long setup. But so uh, my first real uh, um, gig was with a guy named Jack McDuff. And I, I was playing in a uh, late night jam session band at the Blue Note in New York. Because back then, the Blue Note, uh, you had the regular shows like they do now. And then Tuesday to Sunday, from 1 a.m. to 4 a.m., they had a band of young guys that came out. And we, we made $15 a piece to play from 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. But we, and, we, and people, there was a line around the corner, young guys trying to get that gig. And so... Uh, I, I played there with Philip Harper and Justin Robinson, and we played every night behind, you know, behind everybody. So uh, um, uh, about two months into that engagement, they were having their sixth anniversary celebration in that in location that they're at now. And so the host that week was Billy Eckstein and his band, and his guests were George Benson, Sarah Vaughn, and Tony Bennett. Uh, and and so. That night, instead of having us play late, uh, after, after the thing, they had us playing during the intermission, so they would have music going on. And George Benson and his wife showed up, and, and, and uh, uh, um, the club owner came to me, uh, Stephen Ben Susan's father, Danny, <laughs> came to me and said, hey, uh, George Benson is here, and he doesn't have his guitar, can he use yours? So if you, when you walk into the Blue Note, you make a left, and you'll see a picture of George with his hands up. That's my guitar he's holding. That's the night we met. That's... That's uh, October, whatever, 1987. So, uh, um, so he played, you know, and he, and he was great. And then, uh, uh, and his wife was looking at me, kind of laughing. She's like, "Well, I guess you're lucky. You happy? You don't have to play after George." And I was like, "Well, actually, we got to play right now." <laughs> and I was panicked, you know. And so, uh, George said, "Well, hey, man, I'd love to hear you play, but I'm gonna have to come back, to, you know, catch you another time, you know." And, uh, but uh, thanks for letting me use the guitar, and he bounced. Now that was great. Cause I'm excited and inspired. I you know, just met my hero and the whole thing, and, and 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 now he's gone, so I don't have to be nervous. It was probably the best I'd ever played up to that point. Little did I know he was hiding behind the door. He never left. He just didn't want me to be nervous, so he stayed, listened to me play, and left me a note. Uh, and he came back the following week, and like well, just like he said, he said I'll be back next Tuesday to hear you play. He came back and he said uh, playing with your friends is great. Um, but you know, you 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 need. I think you could just tell from my energy that I needed I needed some direction from someone that I would uh, from some, from people that I would respect enough, uh, or you know, uh, respect enough and admire enough to not question. You know, you could see that energy in me, right? I'm being <laughs> gentle with myself here. <laughs> anyway, he said, "Man, you got to play with Jack McDuff because he will insist." that every effort you make is your best. And so he said, I'm going to Europe for a month. When I come back, I'll take you up to Harlem to, to meet Jack and we'll see if he can get you in the band. And so the next morning when I woke up, I'm like, I'm not waiting for George. A month from now, I need to go play with Jack. I'm going to find him. So I, I found out where he's playing. And that night, I went I went to Showman's, which used to be on, and, on Frederick Douglass between 124th and 125th. And so I went and saw what Jack was playing. I walked up to him and introduced myself and said, I'm a guitar player. And he said, oh, well, you're lucky. Uh, you're in luck. My guitar player is leaving the band. So you can come by my place tomorrow and want an audition. And so I did and whatever. I got, I got in the band. And, and, uh, and so I got in the band and then, jo- and then Jack fired me every night for the next three, four weeks. <laughs> just at the end of the night, man, it was just like, after every gig, it was just a a barrage of horribly insulting one-liners, you know, and they were all like, cut. They were so precise and right on. He had this really annoying quality. That he he had like he was like a comedian, like a, you know, he had this you know a, a sort of a, a sharp, piercing one-liner that that it that spoke to the heart of whatever it was you weren't doing right, and and it was in a way that, and there was no, and there was no room for a, a clever retort. It was just this is what it is, and so. Uh, um, and he could tell that I, you know, that I, that I was thick-skinned, but also, you know, kind of had a little thing, you know, a little, little guy macho about me, you know. And so he was like, so we, uh, uh, um, we went through a, a number of things. And so uh, uh, he would yell at me and say, uh, it looks like a guitar, but it sounds like a banjo. And I was like, what the, uh, really? Like, there's people here, you know. I, 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 what? 
And, and then I realized what he meant was, you know, he, he insisted, this is why it was such a great experience for me, he insisted that I comp with him. You know, usually when there's more than one chordal instrument, you know, people just kind of default to uh, uh, taking turns so that you don't step on each other's toes. But here's the problem. You don't learn to, you don't learn to, to work together, right? And so he insisted that I comp while he comp behind the other, you know, we, we worked like a little, a little mini orchestra. And, and to do that, we had to play voicings with the same colors. You know, I couldn't play flat nine when he played natural nine. You know, these things, because they clashed. And so, uh, uh, whatever, and that, you know, and I, I had never experienced that, uh, um, that level of, 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 uh, uh, of, uh, of orchestration and, 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 and focus from a from a you know from a a, a, a supporting role you, you you're soloing you're in the front line then then you're paying you know at that point you're paying attention to detail but here I was being having my eyes open to the you know how important it was to to be to be great behind someone you know to, how important that was and so uh, um, and as guitar players that's especially in jazz that's not always something you worry about right you're just trying to so it was beautiful for me uh, and he you know and then it got to the point where. You know, and I, and I quickly figured out how to kind of work his crowd, right? So then I got cocky because I was getting a lot of applause. You know, that was my comeback, you know. And, and then uh, so one day, um, I, you know, cocky for me, but I wasn't, you know, being disrespectful. I was just kind of, you know. And so uh, he could sense that I'm, my chest was poked out a little too much. And so after the first set, he said, uh, hey, man, let's step outside for a second. And I'm like, yeah, sure. We stepped outside. He said, what, 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 whose name is up on the marquee? And I was like, well, it says Jack Meuf, because it was missing the D. <laughs> Smart ass kid, right? <laughs> and he was like, he was like, well, where's your name? He says, it's missing all your letters. And I was like, uh, yeah. And he said, you know, uh, uh, they're going to clap for every guitar player that plays with me because it's my band, it's my music, and it's going to sound good. Don't let the crowd response inform your opinion or your assessment of how you're playing. It's not about what, it's not me, it's not me telling you, don't take it, don't, don't receive the comp. It's not about that. I'm not trying to bring you down and lift you up. He said, you, you know, you're at the beginning of your journey. Keep, keep striving for, uh, uh, if, so if you play something tonight and the crowd responds, that's, you did that. Now, tomorrow night, I don't want you to show up and do the same thing for crowd response. Tomorrow night, we start a new journey. You find another way. To reach the people, so this is this is not a show. This this is art that we're creating in front of people. And and first of all, you know, people didn't really think of you know people from musicians from Jack's sort of organ blues tradition. Uh, um, I certainly didn't think of him, you know, even naive of myself, that he would be that concerned about the art of it. But of course he was. It was, it was the only. It was the thing that was most sacred to him. Was that you know was music and creativity in the moment. And he's like, so yeah, you found, you know, you found something that you can do that you know people can, can get with. You, great. But if that's all you do, then we become a circus act. We, we're, no, we're not playing music anymore. And so, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I recognized that it was no, it was no resistance for me with that because I already knew that in, in what I was doing, in moments where I felt uh, uncomfortable or insecure, I would just default to something I knew would get a good, you know, I did this yesterday, it was work great, I got that. He's like, and so uh, um, to reinforce that, you know, as, as we play the melody, you know, with the group, and then he would kind of point to us to solo, you know, and it cut you off and whatever. And when I, you know, when a, when a solo that I played, you know, went well in terms of, you know, checked all the boxes, you know, created creativity, you know, not too long, whatever it was, then I could, I could count on being pointed to for the, a solo on the next two. But I knew, I knew when I hadn't been up to par because he would skip me. <laughs> he would just be like, you. <laughs> you know, and so, uh, um, so I, and I stayed with Jack for about 18 months. And it was just, it was the most intense graduate school. Uh, when I was done with, I, you know, I, I joined his band as a, you know, a kid out of college. 18 months later, I was signed to Warner Brothers, you know. that, uh, um, And it's not like... It, you know, and I and I was I wasn't ready. We're never ready, but I definitely what didn't feel ready to put myself on 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 you know on blast on the national stage. You know, on recording. The problem was my wife was pregnant, and and I didn't have any good paying gigs and whatever. And I was like, 
this kid didn't ask to be poor, so I got to make something happen. So I rushed the process of making demo tapes and hanging out, you know, and, and George helped me and, and Tommy LaPuma signed me. And, and so uh, here's the beautiful thing, and this is the second, another example of something good that happened or something important to me. That one of the great, greatest lessons you learn, or I've learned, I like to share with people, is it's not about um, how you assess what stage you're at. Because if you had the benefit of hindsight, you would see how wrong you were in your attempt to assess when you're ready. What Because it, it, you don't know why you're doing it, you know, what, what impact it's going to have. And so the, the, most, the most important thing to come from, besides just you know, having a career and making a living, right? the most important thing to come from the process of writing music, rehearsing a band, recording it, and you remember, this is recording in 1990. I got Tommy LaPuma and Al Schmidt in there, you know. They, and, 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 you know, and, and this, this is in Pro Tools. This is two-inch tape. Like, we got two or three takes of a song, and that's it. You know, editing is a guy, at, you know, bouncing two-inch tape to one-inch tape with a razor blade. You know, you know that's it. You know, and so overdubs, you had a couple, and then that was a wrap, right? And so um, hearing, you know, hearing everything under a microscope, uh, uh, I was able to immediately identify uh, um, things that I, that I needed to work on, uh, um, p places where I felt limited, things that I had overlooked, uh, um, sound, and, 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 and uh, um, the ability to deliver a message immediately. You know, and so the difference between, for me, the difference between Miles Davis and John Coltrane is not that, you know, Miles played simple and John Coltrane plays, played complicated. It's like, it just... They both had a very important personal message that they delivered in, in everything they played, uh, um, and once I once you get past the uh, the facade of simplic of simpli you know some, whether something is simplistic or complicated, then you can just feel the emotional impact, and you know and and see and so I and I learned to get I learned to stop seeing. Uh, stop focusing on because your technique and these things are all going to get better with time. But it, you know, is 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 the, is the is the message coming through clearly? If not, uh, um, and so uh, uh, I was disappointed in making the record because I had all this. You know, my my, my default was playing fast, right? And Tommy the Puma wouldn't let me do that. Every time you know, he's like, "Man, that's just you know." And 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 I was I was afraid that without my without my shield, you know. Well, fast notes, I wasn't going to be impressive. People weren't going to dig it. And Jack McDuff called me when the record came out. He heard it on the radio. He, and, and, and he had given me this nickname, Popcorn, which I did not like. Uh, popcorn, because he said my solo sounded like popcorn, like popcorn to the popcorn maker. When I first, he's like, pop, 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 like, just notes everywhere. Right? You know, I was just like, oh, man, come on. So he called me and he said, and he had, he had a great voice. And he said, hey, Popcorn. And I said, oh. Yes, Jack. He said, I heard your new record. He said, man, I'm so proud of you. There's no popcorn in it. <laughs> he said, everything you played was so clear. And, and you know, and that's that's all I was trying to get you to do. And I was so concerned that it was too simple, that it, it wasn't flashy enough. It wasn't, you know, people going to think I, and, and I, and so I learned right away, man, get outside of your opinion of what it has to be and just, and just let music flow for the sake of that. You know, don't worry about, don't, you know, try not to find things to be, uh, um, to cover my insecurities. Get outside of that. And that's when, when, the, when, the, when my true essence will begin to, develop, to, to evolve and grow. When I think about uh, uh, the qualities that are important, that, I, that, that, that are essential for me, what I'm looking for, especially a young musician, someone new that I, that I want to hire, um, you, you know, it, it's the first thing is uh, um, you you know you, you want someone who is unafraid uh, um, to expose what they really have to play, what they really have to say, uh, um, because you it, and that may sound weird, but what what I mean by that is a young a new a young musician is never going to know all the things you want them to play. A beautiful thing is when someone allows themselves to play beyond what they know. And so you, ha so you have to have spent, uh, you know, whatever time it is to get to connect to your instrument in such a way that the things you're hearing can flow through you. 
but then you have to be uh, you have to be confident uh, um, and brave enough to expose what that is and just let and let that sit because I can work with that. So you, so there's a certain amount of honesty necessary. You know, all of the fundamentals we you know that's got to be in place because if they're not, we're not even in that process. So so. Uh, um, and I'm not someone, you know, I, we all have, all of us as, as, old, as musicians and people have, have we have um, different approaches to, to teaching or learning or, you know, I'm not someone, I don't nitpick. I'm not someone who, you know, comes with a list of do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. So for me, you, you know, I, if you, if you just have to pay attention. If you pay attention, uh, uh, all the information you need to get from me so that we can connect is there. Um, and I, you know, I'm not one to to shove uh, harsh criticisms or, or advice down someone's throat. So uh, let's 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 just revisit that. So one, a certain honesty and confidence. Two, uh, um, you have to pay close attention. And, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll make I'll uh, make that a little more uh, um, uh, obvious. So when I when I went James Genus and I went out to Roy Haynes' house in, in 1987, we drove out you know to Long Island. He had divided us out to play, and you know and I was playing well, but I was pretty nervous, right? And so, and I mean, Roy Haynes' house. So, you know, we played about a half an hour, you know, and, and, and I, I'm sure I had my eyes closed and my head down the whole time. And finally, Roy stopped and he said, hey, man, I'm over here. <laughs> you know, you got to look at me. <laughs> and, and, I, I, and, you know, and, and I just, you know, nodded and said, okay. Uh, um, and then he, could, but I could tell he looked. He looked at me. He's like, "Yeah, this kid doesn't understand what I mean." He's like, "He's like, you know, you can play. If you couldn't play, I wouldn't ask you to come out. Like, I'm, it's not about the notes you're playing now. It's about your ability uh, uh, um, to speak to me with them. And and I need. He said, I'm, I need some you know, visual affirmation. Like we have, you know, because there's things about what we're doing that." You know, just listen. Someone who, someone without sight, develops their other, you know, uh, uh, you know, other senses in a way they can. But you, you look, you, you just got your eyes closed, so you're just you're missing all the, you know, all the opportunity we have here to connect. So, so there's that, right? So, uh, pay attention, and then, and then, uh, um, uh, be willing uh, um, to. Uh, and I used to say this to my kids even. If I say something, make you know, make a statement about something, and you don't agree, it's not so much important to me that you explain to me why you don't agree, as it is important to me that you take a moment and become an advocate for the other side. Even though you don't agree, try to figure out for yourself why I'm right. Like, what does it look like if what I said is right? Because I don't, because I don't need to be right. I just need, I just need you to, cons I need you to, to to see what I'm saying, so you can apply that to what you're doing. Cause, you know, because if we were on opposite sides, once again, you probably not someone I'm trying to hire. So we're already there. Like it's just so. Don't let your ego or your insecurities or just what or even, you know, the energy of how I'm approaching you, uh, affect your ability to learn from the moment. Because as, as the other thing is, I'm not someone who just tells people things to feel important. Like, because you know, if I if I don't if I don't think what I know what I'm telling you is gonna do you any good, I'll keep it to myself. And so and so, so it's just you know, I'm not so much about about you know the, you know about the the uh, um, the qualities of professionalism. You don't have to, but there are things. It's, it's it's not about being on time or being prepared because I'm gonna be annoyed if you aren't. It's like if you're if you're not on time and you're not prepared, then you're limiting. There's, there's already a limit on how much we can accomplish. It just, it's just really that simple. If you haven't learned the music, then, that it's, we got, then we have to wait that much longer to get inside the music and, become, and start to create together. I, I wait for you to learn it first. So, you know, so it's just those things. And, so I, and, 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 I, and I, I don't think there's a situation in music where those things wouldn't serve you well. All right, so here are a, a few of the things, big no-nos, right, every, that every young musician should be aware of. Um, number one, no matter how, uh, um, how much your instincts are telling you to try to relate to the older cats, 
and be one of the guys, don't. Just, it's okay to just be the young apprentice who comes in, don't talk too much, don't, you know, you know don't, just stay in your lane. And, you know, and, and, and it, it, it's interesting. It's not about, you know, being heard. And not, it's, not, it, it's, it's not even about respect. It's just you don't, you don't know them, you know. Uh, um, and so it, it, give it time. You know, uh, uh, every thing, it's funny how things like that will develop if you let it happen. And, and oftentimes uh, when we get nervous or, you know, we default to doing too much, don't get the doing too much award. Like just, you know, you're there, you're already there. So you don't have to impress someone. Right. Uh, um, so yeah, don't make the mistake of, 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 uh, uh, of doing too much, saying too much, being too, just be cool. Uh, being cool is, uh, man, it's, 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 it's a hard thing to do sometimes, but it's so important. Um, never allow yourself to put forth the energy uh, that uh, that outshines, uh, um, or or in some way, uh, um, in some way uh, uh, covers covers up or takes the spotlight away from the person that's hired you. Um, and 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 and, it, and it's not about uh, it's not even about catering to that person's ego or thing. It's just. You, you you know someone who who has put all this time into developing their career and and create and created this opportunity and hired you to be a part of it, just be a part of it. You know, show them the gratitude, uh, and 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 show the people that are there to to, to enjoy that. Uh, help you know help them to enjoy what's happening. Don't you know? Never try to steal the show. And and, and here's and and and. and even if the person you're working with or for doesn't mind, here's the worst part about that energy. You're not stealing the show. You're just putting a lot of energy into trying to steal the show. And that's how it always comes off. Like, man, that guy was great, but he just wouldn't stop playing. I never got to hear Herbie because the saxophone player would never, like, you know. And I, you know, I, I, and a lot of the old cats, they wouldn't say anything. They're just like, well, just, you know, whatever it is. Uh, then they just don't call you again. So uh, um, here's the thing: someone can all someone can always ask you to play more. So play well, be intense, be in the moment, be present, but be short, and let them invite you to do more. That's it, that that makes you know that makes everyone happy. So that, so, uh, so yeah, stay in your lane, and then don't and don't put the and don't put the energy out there that says you want to steal the show. Uh, um, you know. Uh, um, and never be the reason that something goes wrong. Like, at, at, I, if, if at all possible, right? Don't be the reason the band misses the plane, misses the train. Don't don't be the reason. Don't be the reason the show is late. Don't just don't be the reason. If, some things you just can't control, but uh, uh, don't be the reason. The, the tune just do everything you can do to be on point at all at all because you're new. You're building your story. You know, uh, um, I've been playing guitar for 50 years. I've been on the scene since 1987. So people that know me, if I, you know, if I show up later, mess something up, I don't, it's not great. But I got 35 years of precedent that says otherwise. You can't do me because you're brand new. No one trusts you that way, right? You know, and so it's just... Uh, uh, and I, you know, and 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 I, yeah, man, as a, as a young as a young musician, well, I was a good soldier. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, those are the most important things. Stay in your lane. Be cool. Don't overdo it. Don't be the reason something something goes wrong. And don't put forth that steal the show energy. And you and, and you you stay away from those things. You got it made. If I were being asked to describe the feeling or, or the vibe of a particular moment that was super inspirational and satisfying to me in a way that made me realize for sure that I that this is the greatest job ever, my dream come true. It, man, I, I, the perfect moment, that's, the, that's one of the easiest questions in the world for me to answer. So in 1991, 19, yeah, my record, had, I had a record out, The Marksman, and, and, and I was, had been on tour with a band called The Jazz Futures. Uh, uh, me and Roy Hargrove, Chris McBride, Benny Green, uh, um, Carl Allen, uh, Nicholas, uh, 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 Marlon Jordan, Tim Warfield, Antonio Hart, 
we were t touring opening, opening for Miles Davis, uh, the, the Neville Brothers, and uh, uh, and Wynton Marsalis. And we, so we did all <laughs> and we did all the jazz festivals in the states. We did we were, you ever made a live record, and the tour ended with us playing at Newport. We played, we played uh, uh, Newport the Newport Jazz Festival that, that August. All right, so then. Um, so then I am out with my band, whatever, uh, just, you know, and I got a call from Quincy Jones to, uh, to, to come be a guest for one of his concerts. And he, had, he was early on in his run of, of uh, his residency at the Montreux Jazz Festival. He was hosting and curating and all these things. And so is a great Quincy Jones, uh, one of his great albums is a thing called Smackwater Jack. Right, and he's got you know a bunch of different uh, uh, things on his you know uh, uh, people saying it, a, a whole bunch of guests on the record, and so he and and the Count Basie band is the band on the record, you know. And so he had the Count Basie band at at Montreux, and he was conducting. So Frank Foster is the directing is in the band, and his guests were George Duke, George Benson, Clark Terry, Shaka Khan, Rochelle Farrell, and and me. Right, <laughs> and so I I had no idea what I was being invited to, so I showed up to the you know I got I was in, on tour in Europe and it was like I took my tour got to the venue and I was like uh oh oh no like what the hell am I doing here you know and and it made it worse it was a big it was a huge concert you know and George Benson was band he played the first half of the concert with his band and then the second half was you know. He, Q directed the, the big band and all of us playing together, and so I was like, "Well, I'm, this is a, this is amazing. I'm I'm just here. I'm just gonna play some rhythm behind George, and this is amazing, right?" So we all stage together in rehearsal, and, and George can see that he sees things. Where he's like, "Oh, I can see it." Because he doesn't have a solo for me, like he wasn't trying to, you know, and I wouldn't even ask for one. So, in we're doing Dizzy Gillespie's Manteca, boom, ding, doom, ding. And the band is killing, you know, and Clark is playing, and, and George is like, hold on, hold on, hold on. And he's like, hey, man, why don't you let Mark play on this, too, with me? And I was like, man, with you? Wait, 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 come on, man. No, no, you know, like, and so Chris is like, oh, well, George, if you don't mind, great. So George is like, see, man, I got you the whole thing. All right. And uh, uh, so, um, but then George forgot. That he uh, has, and he said that, right? So, this, so it's kind of just on YouTube now, right? So, we're playing, we're playing, and George takes this long solo. And he's and and he's playing. I can tell he's done, but he's but he thinks now the tune's gonna end. He forgot that he told. So he's just like kind of playing, 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 you know, like, waiting for Q, for Q to like direct. And finally, Quincy says, "Let him do it, George Benson." Like, dude, stop playing, you know? He's like, "All right, he stopped playing." And then I came in. And George turned. He's like. And then he had this big smile on his face, you know, my face, you know, I came in with my best stuff, you know, and, and, uh, um, and, you know, it was great, and the crowd went nuts, and I played really well, and I was happy, you know, and I played, short, I played a really short solo, and it was just, you know, in and out, and, and, and when it was over, uh, uh, you know, I, I walked off stage, and I was kind of shaking, just, you know, excited, and Shaka Khan pulled me to the side, and she said, come here, young man, I said, yeah, she said, you know, I've been knowing George Benson of all, um, all, all my life, and I've never seen anybody make him do this. <laughs> I said, that's it. Now go ahead. <laughs> and I was like, this is the greatest job ever. Like, I just, I, you know what I mean? That, that dude is the reason I played the guitar, and I stood next to him at his, you know, at his request and played a good enough solo for him to go, yeah, you know, in front of all these. Man, I, that was it for me. I, you know, I knew I was, I was good from that point on.